Welcome to the Physique Development Podcast. Today is our first ever guest interview on the podcast. Yes, we've done over a hundred plus episodes, but today is the first interview. Now, I thought no one better than my friend Sam Miller to be the first guest on the podcast to give you guys some insight on how the gut health and mental health are intertwined and how they impact one another, how we can improve mental health through improving our gut health. It's a gem of an episode. I'm excited for you guys to dig in. But before we get into the episode, go ahead and like this video, subscribe to the channel. And if you have not yet, leave us a comment or review on your favorite listening platform. I'll see you on the inside. I uh, I was telling you this before we went on, but I am I'm nervous here because this is my my first interview. This, you're the perfect person, as this is going to be uh, very informative as a whole. But uh, I think that everyone's going to get a a lot out of this episode, as well as uh, you will very much so carry this. And <laughs> if I do screw up from a, a question asking perspective or interview uh, standpoint, I I know you will will pick me up for sure. I think also just that means on a very deeper level, that's like a subtle hint that I'm like the least intimidating of, of your friends and connections. So I'm just a less, yeah, that, uh, that could be true as well. Formative that presence versus uh, <laughs> a couple of the other guys that, that we talk to from time to time. You're just like, yeah, Sam, Sam's just kind of like the, you know, easier guy to kind of bring in for this transition, but hopefully we can have a good conversation and certainly happy to, you know, carry the conversation if needed, but I'm sure you'll, you'll dust off the cobwebs in no time. Of course. So with with Sam's knowledge, guys, the, the number one thing that I feel, there's a handful of things that you're an expert in, but the, the first one being gut health, that's the first thing that comes to mind. I feel like you were the individual who really started to tap into gut health before many people were. And I remember a, a portion of your bio that stuck out to me was that uh, I probably coach your coach. And I love that because it was it was true. It's still true to this day, but it was very true, especially at that time. And I, it speaks volumes to the the knowledge that you carry, especially in a field that is continuing to grow from a body of literature, but also grow from uh, people realizing how much they're struggling with these things. For sure. Yeah. The old school bios, this was probably like, geez, I, we probably would have met in like 2017, 2018. So maybe like social media, virtual connection in 17 meet in person, I think at the Arnold in 2018. And at the time, I'm pretty sure my bio was, um, you know, one of my, I wrote like goal, know all the things without being a dick about it. And then it was like 62% chance I coach your coach. So it's just, what I found was around that time when I was shifting more towards mentorship and the, my program that I have now, um, more of my coaching clients from a nutrition perspective were actually coaches themselves. And then I also had the mentorship program going on at the same time. So had more of the B2B or business offer that I was, that I was running where we were providing mentorship, continuing education on more science, uh, hormones, gut health, and all those things. But at the same time, the clients I still had on my roster were also health professionals themselves, either personal trainers, nutrition coaches, strength and conditioning coaches, had some uh, nurses and doctors and things as well. Um, so it just seemed appropriate and also just kind of was a, a rough estimate of what was actually going on. And at that time, you know, when you're just kind of building your initial following, it's like having a little bit of personality in the bio can be helpful too, versus like too much of a resume, right? Where right. Yours, yours should just be like, Dad to Gus and Tuck. <laughs> <laughs> that a part owner of the Packers. And yeah, those would be the first two things. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and within the the client base of, of physique development over the years, we've continued to see greater cases that are just beyond changing training and nutrition and finding that the gut health component and having knowledge there and being able to navigate and help the client on that side of things has become more and more important and has been a much greater focal point within their their protocols and those different factors. So within the the gut health component of things, do you feel as though that this is something that has uh, gain popularity in a, a, a positive way or 
This is <laughs> this is where I'm struggling a little bit. You're like, is it a positive way or is it just we got <laughs> trends and fads now related to gut health and kind of buzz? It's like a buzzword topic, right? It's just like with certain things related to training. Uh, I feel like there's there's certain kind of catchy lingo and terms that get thrown around a lot, right? Like with gut health, I think maybe the direction you're going is like people starting to know what leaky gut is, right? And then there there's that combined with words like detox and inflammation and there's all these buzzwords, but people don't necessarily know, like, does this apply to me? What do I do about it? Is this actually evidence-based or is this just some sort of marketing gimmick to like get me to buy something? Right. And, and because a part of the supplementation part of things, the research isn't overly convincing as a whole. Like there is a growing body of literature, but there's not a ton of literature backing a multiple or multiple supplements that people are pushing more so. And that could be for a multitude of different reasons, but some of the supplements that are out there are not backed by a massive body of research yet. Right. And I think we've got some uh, that are particular or specific to gut health. So like zinc carnosine, for example, that's a particular type of zinc that, hey, we, we do have some research here. There are some basic supplements and micronutrients like vitamin D or um, potential staples in your arsenal that I think you, you would have good reason to use them for your gut health and your overall health. I think where gut health sometimes gets, uh, there's a lot of carryover kind of spillover into some of the fads is people think that, you know, like just simply taking a probiotic is going to help them with their weight loss journey, right? And there's definitely a lot of great probiotic research, especially if you're someone who's like been suffering from symptoms related to taking antibiotics or you just benefit from that probiotic support. But it's not necessarily a situation where, you know, because I took a probiotic, that's the only reason I lost like 20 pounds, right? And for a while, there was a little bit of that in the marketing of people who had these aesthetic goals like fat loss goals or maybe even performance goals. And people were using gut health as like the crux of that argument for a particular supplement. I feel like that was misleading for consumers, but I do certainly think, you know, gut is an important topic and something that deserves the attention it's getting because it's at the intersection of so many things, our immune system health. Um, there's a lot of, um, discussion on social media around hormones, endocrinology, different things like adrenals, thyroid, reproductive health, women's menstrual cycle health. And it's really hard to have those conversations in isolation without bringing gut health into uh, the picture because it plays such a large role in absorption and what's going on in terms of our overall uh, health and micronutrient status. And it is a center for inflammation in itself, which can impact you know our mood, our energy levels, and so much more. Yes. And in and- with that, I think that how involved it is in so many different factors is such a big reason why the body of literature is going to continue to grow. And I think it's going to be such a big benefit within coaches and, and overall fitness journeys and those different factors. And um, as I was talking with our uh, clients at Physique Development prior to having you on today, was that I wanted to ask them what were some of the questions or what were some of the things that they wanted to learn from you um, with this opportunity just to, to ask you more specific questions. And they had brought up a desire to learn more about how gut health is going to be impacting overall mental health and is there any connection between the two? And I thought that that was a fantastic way for us to to dig into today's topic of that being the, the case and seeing what your answer is to that as well as what your thoughts are and those different factors. So um, Sam, what is the connection between gut health and overall mental health? So I'd say there's three main things we can talk about and kind of fit within the scope of today's podcast and for the average, you know, PD client, or just for someone who's listening to this, who's a health enthusiast or maybe coach themselves. And we're looking to optimize this. What we need to understand is number one, first and foremost, um, having optimal gut health is important because when we don't, when we either have a dysbiotic environment or we have intestinal permeability, which is basically more of the scientific term for leaky gut, which is what people talk about on, you know, Instagram and various sort of blogs and, and things like that. Leaky gut is more of the popular terminology, but really it's synonymous with intestinal permeability. So the gut is a center of inflammation. And really when we're talking about inflammation, we just need to remember uh, that's essentially immune system activation. So that's the first part. The second part is going to be poor gut health can directly impact micronutrient status in itself. So simply, you know, having poor gut health, whether that's lower stomach acid levels, 
dysbiosis, which we'll talk about in a little bit, just as far as like improper ratios of bacteria and, you know, having subpar micronutrient status, that's going to impact our mood, but also things like our adrenal health, our testosterone, our thyroid, and a lot of other important sort of facets of our overall health. And then the last part, which is more of the brain health conversation and the nuance of like neurotransmitters is inflammation, whether it's stemming from the gut or otherwise in the body. And usually the gut is a main source of this. It can actually impact pathways and enzymes that impact the production of serotonin. And so instead of sort of these positive compounds that we need for our mood and overall well-being, we can actually end up with neurotoxins and uh, that can be problematic in terms of overall mental health. So really, if we think of it as kind of three converse, three separate conversations, but within it, there's this large theme of inflammation and neurodegeneration. And then the other ac aspect is going to be gut health and micronutrient status. So for the average client, this could stem from, you know, past diet history, intense training, there, there's reasons these gut health issues can kind of pop up and how it would impact their mental health for the otherwise healthy client who's seeing changes in their mood. Um, different prescription medications or history of antibiotic usage, all of those things can kind of play a role. Um, and then we can kind of unpack like how this might be showing up in someone's life and uh, what we can kind of do about it as far as solutions or some low hanging fruit if someone's experiencing these issues. So you touched on a handful of buzzwords within that uh, description of things. Let's go ahead and unpack some of these and uh, speak to the aspect in which the the gut is going to serve as a center of inflammatory response. And what are some of the other ways that inflammation can present itself throughout the body maybe? For sure. So when we look at centers of inflammation, you could think of this as, you know, we have inflammation that can stem from the gut and we'll probably spend most of our time talking about this today just because it's so uh, related to mental health and our conversation around gut health. We also have things like stress. So stress in itself um, can be a problem. Blood sugar regulation or having increased body fat levels can also be a center of inflammation. But the reason gut health and gut centered inflammation is so important for our mental health and the hypothesis of basically neurodegeneration, depression, or folks who struggle with mental health and anxiety is when we essentially have our poor gut health, we have a you know, dysbiotic environment and intestinal permeability. And if you think of it as like interlocked hands, uh, if you will, so if you're watching this on video, you could think of me having my hands together. And if I were to start to pull my hands apart, there's sort of some weak links in the chain where things can sort of sleep, uh, slip through and, and basically get out into circulation. And when that happens, when things are moving through that barrier, it's designed to be somewhat semi-permeable. But if we really have a unhealthy degree of permeability, we're essentially having things that are supposed to stay in the gut actually get out into circulation into the bloodstream. And this further activates the immune system and causes more activation uh, of, of that immune system. And that's where we start to see elevations in things like inflammatory messengers in the body. So if you've ever heard anyone say the word like inflammatory cytokine or um, any, any of that kind of terminology from a scientific perspective, really what they're just talking about is chemical messengers that are responsible for sending the signal of inflammation. And that could be true. You know, we have these messengers, if you had something going on with your ankle, you know, it's not specific just to the gut, right? If you had an injury or anything like that, you're going to have these sort of cytokines involved. But the problem is, is when we have this, you know, increased gut permeability, you have these things seeping out uh, more frequently. And then, you know, with dysbiosis, that buzzword is really just talking about our ratios of bacteria. So in a healthy gut, you know, we have a good amount of commensal bacteria. That's just kind of a bigger word to signify. Uh, they're, they're essentially beneficial bacteria. And then there's opportunistic bacteria, which if we have too much of that, a preponderance of that opportunistic bacteria, that's where you start to see things like small intestinal bacteria overgrowth or folks who are really struggling with bloating, distension, uh, sort of infrequent or uncomfortable bowel movements, some deviations on the Bristol stool chart in terms of stool consistency and things like that. So dysbiosis just means like a shift in bacterial patterns or trends because we have so many different species of bacteria in the gut. Um, so we're not really trying to uh, pinpoint just one per se. We're just seeing a general trend towards that dysbiosis. So when we have dysbiosis and intestinal permeability, both in, in themselves are actually inflammatory. And a lot of that is because of the, the consequence that it has for the immune system and those chemical messengers that are going on in the body. So that's kind of the first part. As far as other centers of inflammation, that would be things like stress, you know, lack of sleep, uh, potentially, you know, that circadian disruption that I mentioned and, uh, 
all of those can certainly impact our mental health. And then the last would just be if we're not at a healthy body composition. So for folks who maybe do need to, you know, lose a bit of weight or uh, drop some adipose tissue, you know, that fat tissue in itself sends off chemical messengers, which are different than the messengers if we were to have more muscle on our frame. So this is where, you know, building muscle is not only this, like, you know, when we talk about physique development and we're, you know, right now we're doing physique development podcast and YouTube, we're talking about developing our physique. It's not only just for the aesthetic benefits, but also, you know, muscle um, is sort of a messenger in itself. And that has um, sort of these wide range of consequences in the body. So that's where, uh, we can start to see, you know, those different things impact overall, um, mental health and just our, our level of inflammation as a whole, uh, which we can kind of continue to talk about as we get into today's podcast. And then the, you know, next thing is this dysbiosis intestinal permeability will kind of bring us to our second point that we were talking about earlier. And that was how poor gut health can directly impact micronutrient deficiencies. So someone who's really struggling with their microbiome, that actually impacts micronutrient absorption. And then being impaired from a micronutrient perspective actually makes the microbiome worse. So it's kind of this vicious cycle. If we're impaired from a micronutrient perspective, it makes gut health worse. If gut health is poor, that makes our micronutrient status worse. So then we end up in kind of this round and round we go. Um, and that's really where we need quality coaching to intervene and make sure that we can um, you know, address those particular issues. Coming back to the gut permeability, is there anything that I, I know you spoke on the, the sleep and the stress, but is there anything that's going to be like big hitters that will increase the the permeability that's there? Uh, so as far as things that increase intestinal permeability, you know, our audience listening, most of these folks are health enthusiasts, meaning that their drivers of intestinal permeability are likely different than a sedentary audience. So for sedentary population, things like the standard American diet or Western eating, so very uh, you know, hyper palatable, high calorie foods that are not very micronutrient dense, that can drive intestinal permeability. You know, lack of um, appropriate exercise and movement, just having more inflammation and body fat in the body. But for for the audience really listening, that are, that's more health minded, which would be most of the folks that we're talking to today. For them, it's really going to be that stress component. You know, ensuring proper sleep and recovery. You know, having a good micronutrient status. That's going to be important. All of these things are helping to prevent intestinal permeability, basically. And then just being cognizant of our training volume, frequency, intensity. So sometimes people sort of have too much of a good thing, right? Or Alex, people think like more is better all the time, when in reality, we need sort of the right dose and uh, the appropriate recoverability for that dose of exercise. So for for healthy clients where I've actually seen them run into issue with their gut, if they're and by healthy, I mean like not overweight or obese, where they start to struggle with this is maybe they're training a bit too much or they're under eating or they do have high stress in their lifestyle. And those are some of the key drivers of the gut dysfunction um, that they're experiencing. Within the aspect, speaking back to the, the micronutrients, when we look at the intake there, is this something that you are generally supplementing with a uh, multivitamin or are you lending more to whole foods and, and those different factors? I think it can be done Either way, now if someone is running a pretty significant deficiency, we probably do want some supplements for a period of time and focusing on the absorption of those. So a quality multivitamin, if it's the right formats. Um, so for example, usually with our minerals, those are things that it kind of ends in like ATE for the most part. So like magnesium glycinate, uh, zinc gluconate or glycinate uh, versus things like zinc oxide, magnesium oxide, et cetera. Uh, we also have other minerals that are important too, like selenium and everything. But you could, you could potentially include a multivitamin or individual standalone nutrients that you are predisposed to deficiency. So for example, a lot of athletes do need a bit more magnesium. Um, if this is a women's health case, we might see like a combination of like a B complex and magnesium. If someone's uh, also looking to address other elements of micronutrient deficiency, we might need zinc or selenium. So it may depend on the client, but I always recommend doing a thorough dietary recall and food audit first. And this is where cr uh, chronometer can actually be a very helpful tool in addition or as a replacement for my fitness pal. So my fitness pal is great to get some surface level information on things like macros and fiber. But, uh, I, the reason I really like chronometer is not only do they have a little bit of tighter regulations around their food database. So it's not only user contributions. Everything's kind of audited by their team to make sure that the macronutrient accuracy is, is on point. 
but it also has much more specific micronutrient data. So I could look at a client's you know, intake and look at their overall food log over three to seven days, maybe a couple of weekdays and a weekend. And I could identify, Hey, these are your go-to foods. You know, you're getting plenty of, you know, let's say they're eating like dark leafy greens and stuff. I'm like, cool. Copper's great over here. Um, but maybe like zinc's not as good, or we're not getting enough magnesium or, Hey, you don't really have a lot of dietary sources of selenium. And so that's where, um, with micronutrient deficiencies, we may be supplementing with single, uh, ingredient supplements. So I mentioned like zinc carnosine earlier, that can actually be a a pretty solid intervention for gut health if zinc is needed. But we may also strategically be adding things based off the food log. So I do like to start with food, but it's not always necessarily adequate. Another great example of where food's probably not going to do the trick would be vitamin D. So adding like D3 and K2 as a supplement on top of your, um, you know, your dietary intake, because unless someone's getting plenty of sunlight and they're eating, you know, a lot of whole eggs and things, it's pretty rare. I would say most people do need um, a little bit of that vitamin D supplementation. So there are exceptions, but I think we're going to need a blend of, um, you know, single ingredient whole foods, and then also potentially strategically adding some supplements on top as well. So it sounds like we are utilizing a very individual approach with supplementation as well as nutrition to get the person into the best place possible, as well as keeping up with the, um, would you say there would be specific testing that you are utilizing along the way to ensure that those variables are in the right place? Or are you utilizing more of some biofeedback in those different factors to make sure that those levels are in a better position? So you could actually do both. Um, you know, biofeedback, what's interesting, biofeedback is going to give you more like patterns and trends of what might potentially be helpful for the person. Micronutrient testing in itself can be a little bit more expensive, but we can use proxies from different serum labs uh, to get uh, a decent indicator, or we just have to know the right things to test. So let's say I wanted to know my B12 status. A lot of people actually will go and get serum B12, but a more accurate marker of B12 status is actually called MMA or methylmalonic acid. So you can test your micros in both serum labs. There are some other testing methods you can use for that as well. Um, There's also other proxies that we can use. So homocysteine levels, like if someone is potentially struggling with methylation and has some micronutrient deficiencies, we may see methylation um, issues there via homocysteine. We can also use markers. Uh, so for example, we could see signs of iron deficiency anemia, looking at things like ferritin, total iron binding capacity and things like that. Um, and then for magnesium, we could use an RBC magnesium. Uh, a lot of folks actually mistakenly will, will just order serum magnesium, but RBC magnesium doing something like MMA for, for your B12 status. And then we basically can just use other sort of indirect markers. The, the one that's going to kind of hit the nail on the head is really going to be vitamin D. If we look at our serum vitamin D and that's off, we will know whether to supplement or adjust the diet. So for the most part, I'd say you could use testing, but a much cheaper, solution for most clients starting out is going to be keeping a a very accurate food log and doing a dietary recall. And then, you know, you can even get a free version of chronometer uh, if you don't want the professional version and you could just log, you know, take some of your foods, put in maybe two weekdays and a weekend day and see, you know, a a lot of us tend to fall into patterns with our eatings, favorite lunch meals, favorite dinner meals, go-to breakfast, pre and post-workout nutrition. Let's plug those in. Let's just see where we're at in terms of what we're consuming, because until we test for something, we, we might as well see if we can eat it from our diet or, or get it from a supplement first before you know spending the money on the test. And so if there's something that's lagging in there or our food log seems off, then yeah, sure, um, let's add the supplement. And then if we seem to still have some symptoms of things going on, uh, then of course, I, I still think it's very smart to do health testing you know, depending on the person, it might be every three or six months or so. Um, And then I think everybody should just be doing kind of regular checkups on top of that. So definitely a good question there, Alex. It could be using both the combination of testing, biofeedback, and then I think a really strong tool that's sometimes undervalued is just, you know, a good food log. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. Excellent. So we will shift gears a little bit here and go into that third pathway that you talked about with inflammation and and the brain. So tell us a little bit more about that. 
So when we have inflammation in the body or we're not necessarily living, you know, the best lifestyle for us, for our overall health, mental health and well-being, it's not necessarily, you know, just acutely what's going on in the gut or what's going on acutely with micronutrient deficiencies. But inflammation, micronutrient deficiencies, and our lifestyle actually drive changes in enzymes across the body uh, and the activity of those enzymes. So to use an example for those of you who are maybe less familiar in this area, uh, before we dive into these sort of rabbit holes of neurodegeneration or what's going on with neurotransmitters, think of something a little more simple like thyroid, right? We have to actually convert our thyroid hormone reserve or T4 into metabolically active free T3. So you may have heard that before. There's actually an enzyme that does that uh, for uh, both the uh, guys and ladies listening. If you're familiar with testosterone and estrogen, we know that there's an enzyme that converts testosterone and estrogen that's called aromatase. So all across the body, we have these enzymes. Usually a little hack there is they end in ASE. So if you see aromatase, deidinase, we know, okay, cool, that's, that's actually an enzyme. And so these enzymes um, basically impact important pathways, or, or actually they're, they determine what's happening with the pathways. And then inflammation, rather, is what's really impacting those pathways. And so an enzyme there that's going to impact us specifically at the level of the brain would be called IDO. Um, and so IDO is impacting you know, which pathways we have in terms of this very popular neurotransmitter ser serotonin versus a more neurotoxic pathway um, which is basically creates uh, quinolinate or quinolinic acid. And so those are going to be a little bit more detrimental for our overall brain health and mood versus, you know, having that serotonin. And so when we look at Western medications and common prescriptions that clients are given, or, you know, if someone were to go to their doctor and talk about anxiety or depression, they're commonly prescribed an SSRI, which is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Um, but one of the things we could work on rather than just mechanistically sort of hijacking that serotonin pathway is it can be really powerful to work on these lifestyle factors because addressing inflammation, addressing those cytokines, immune system activation actually does directly impact what's going on with these pathways. Um, and so, you know, we really have to be paying special attention to this conversation around inflammation and neurodegeneration. I think it's why a lot of folks, um, as we've seen society have poor metabolic health, become more inflamed, more obese, uh, poor body composition, and also, you know, micro basically running these micronutrient deficiencies, we see a lot of impairments and uh, strong correlation to our mental health overall. So that's kind of that pathway. Probably the most important one for the purposes of today's podcast is really just looking at what's happening, um, you know, and, and to kind of backtrack it a little bit, what we want to happen in a, in a you know, healthy world, right, is we have a certain amount of tryptophan and that goes down this pathway and we make serotonin. But basically what I'm saying is when we have poor gut health, when we have inflammation, we have immune system activation, what we're seeing is instead of getting that serotonin, we're actually ending up with this other sort of byproduct or compound, which is actually not as uh, beneficial for the brain and can impact our overall mood, um, you know, depression, anxiety, and so forth. With individuals who have been prescribed SSRIs, would you say that they are more prone to um, having any gut health issues or would this be kind of like a indirect correlation that I'm kind of pulling from this? I would say if someone has a history of poor gut health or, you know, I, so I, to kind of walk through an example of how your gut health might be impacted by your childhood or factors in like your formative years, things like antibiotic usage. So as, as a kid, for example, I had a lot of uh, tubes uh, or ear tubes basically, which requires, uh, typically they'll give you antibiotics. I had ear infections and, and tubes. So I was given antibiotics quite frequently. I also uh, based on family history and some hereditary factors and lifestyle, um, had a hernia surgery, which required a lot of antibiotics uh, that they'll give you basically to prevent infection. Other things that can impact your gut microbiome at a young age would be things like breastfeeding versus being formula fed. Um, you know, did you have pets at home? Did you get to play outside? Were you in the dirt and soil and, you know, or were you largely inside? Um, really, we have this very important period as our immune system develops from age zero to five and then continuing through childhood. So, even dating back prior to that prescription of SSRIs, there are just so many factors that can impact our mood, mental health, and overall gut health. Uh, but folks who are prescribed those things a little bit earlier on, sometimes there's a connection to, to some things that happened early in life that are impacting you know, their current, um, current health. 
some folks are getting those SSRIs before they've done any type of nutrition, lifestyle intervention, or modify their training, or they haven't really gone more that functional integrative health approach to things. It's natural to seek relief, right? When we are, when our mood is impacted on a daily basis, we want a solution. And you know, SSRIs are a commonly prescribed solution from Western medical practitioners. And so it is quite possible that the person who was given the SSRI did maybe have some unaddressed gut issues or some deeper um, root cause symptoms that were playing into their mood, their energy levels, their mental health, their hormonal health, but it wasn't necessarily addressed via the conventional medical system. Would you say that with most gut health components and, and, and after this, we'll get into how we can address all these different factors that we've spoken on just now, but do you feel as though with most gut health cases, you've it's not just one thing that you're addressing. There's probably a multitude of different lifestyle factors or functionality to their gut that's needing to be addressed. Yeah. Usually there's a few main themes and then maybe like the straw that broke the camel's back. Right. Um, so if you, and we'll, we'll see this, uh, we can use like a female client example, potentially sometimes it, it could be shifts as a result of, um, you know, it's very common, like antibiotic usage after like a C-section with pregnancy, um, potentially antibiotic usage after UTIs or other infections. It's just very common. I mentioned antibiotic usage a couple of times, but there's other, other sort of insults here that we can have too. It could be high stress. It could be a traumatic life event. Um, sometimes loss of a loved one or the stress of, you know, moving across the country, changing jobs. There's so many different stressors and, and traumatic life events that can impact the health of our gut. So usually there's some, some core items related to our nutrition, our training and our lifestyle. And then there's a few things that normally by themselves might not be the, you know, the offender that's enough to completely tip the scales, but because it's in conjunction with all those other factors, it ends up pushing us towards that kind of poor gut health. Um, and you know, in some cases it does impact our mental health as well, but in other cases, this is where we'll see something like Hashimoto's or autoimmunity. We started with something that might've been a very basic, um, you know, maybe a little bit of stress and some adaptations to thyroid, uh, maybe some chronic dieting history, maybe some changes could have been made in terms of nutrition. And instead, um, you know, that person who's been going down that path for a period of time then had a stressful life event occur. And now all of a sudden we're dealing with autoimmunity and Hashimoto's. So there are patterns that we can see. And usually with the gut, it's, it's not just one thing. It's not isolated to the gut. It's not occurring in a vacuum. Most of these client conversations, whether it's about gut and mental health or whether we're talking about the gut um, and performance or uh, hormonal health, there's a lot of different things going on. A lot of gut cases go hand in hand with adrenal issues and HPA axis activation or thyroid or um, men who have some gut issues may see low testosterone due to poor micronutrient status, fatigue, lethargy. A lot of those symptoms really go hand in hand. So while we may zoom in on the topic of gut health uh, for the purposes of education, we need to remember that in real life when we're dealing with some of this gut stuff, it's oftentimes going hand in hand with a lot of other uh, sort of client troubleshooting as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I wanted to make a, a strong point there because it's oftentimes not just a, a one for one correlation and where people may see from a, a content standpoint that it may be easier to to label someone as the bad guy or as the the evil thing and then their results or whatever the thing that they're you know pushing to be the the answer, it's always going to be more uh, full picture, zoomed out look to really address some of these things. Now, as we look at and, and come back to mental health and, and the um, correlation within gut health, there are things that we can put into place or adjustments that we can make to better fit to improve overall gut health alongside that mental health. So what are some of those things that we have for solutions that will be helpful here? So earlier in the show mentioned things like micronutrient support and getting, um, you know, our food quality improved. So starting with some food tracking and dietary recall, uh, one very helpful, helpful supplement for overall mental health is going to be a DHA and EPA rich fish oil. So something that's going to be very rich in omega threes. We usually want at least a thousand milligrams of DHA and EPA in addressing dysbiosis and intestinal permeability. So if you're someone one way to start here, right, would be your biofeedback. And you can even do a quick search and Google search like a Bristol stool chart. I want you to think about, you know, am I going to the bathroom regularly? So that would be, you know, ideally daily and usually one to three times a day is the sweet spot for going more than three. That's probably a little much, um, unless you're like really, really pushing food very, very high and you're still having good 
bowel movements on the bristol stool chart usually once it goes above three that's not the case though um, we see some variations in terms of overall uh, bowel consistency so we want to look at the bowel frequency and overall quality of your bowel movements and just assessing that through your biofeedback uh, that's a, a great low hanging fruit place to start is biofeedback and that food tracking and, and dietary recall. Omega threes are great for mental health. And, you know, we did talk about micronutrient support, but looking outside of our dietary intake, I think it is important when we're having these conversations around gut and mental health is, you know, our life stressors, both perceived stress and some of the things we're doing in terms of our training um, can be adding to our overall systemic body burden. So if you haven't taken a deload since like, the bears won a super bowl. Uh, you know, we need to really consider, you know, maybe we need to go through a different phase with our training, right? Um, maybe we just need to, to modify things a little bit and that's where having the oversight of a coach can be super helpful. So training is going to be a big one. And then the other lifestyle factors is maybe you need some more parasympathetic inputs in your life. That could be breath work. That could be creative therapy. Maybe you like music or journaling. Uh, that could be time with loved ones. And by creative therapy, you know, some people like to draw or use coloring books. Other people are more into, they want to play guitar or play piano. It's really about finding the things that work best for you. Nature walks work great here, uh, getting into natural environments. So when we're talking about gut health, there's also these components of, you know, just our life in general, where we sometimes need uh, some support to manage the stress that we have. Um, and I mentioned community and loved ones, but it may be necessary, especially if someone's dealing with some challenges related to, you know, mental wellness, emotional well being. It's like, have a conversation with a health professional who specializes in that area, maybe a counselor um, or therapist that can really work with you in conjunction with your training and nutrition, right? These are all important pillars of our, our, our whole personal development really and lifestyle transformation. It's not, uh, I think a lot of people sometimes will focus and, you know, they're doing the sets and reps in the gym, their, ex their training execution is good. And, you know, they're, they're really focused on nailing their nutrition, but they're allowing, um, a lot of things in their life to become these massive stressors that are pulling them out of this sort of parasympathetic state. Uh, they're constantly in fight or flight. It impacts their sleep. It impacts their relationships with other people. And then, you know, even when they go to eat that meal, it's like they're not relaxed and in an optimal state to even digest it. So yeah, you hit your macros, but like your body's not actually an optimal place to absorb the nutrients where they're um, not actually engaged in basic practices like mindful eating, chewing their food, maybe going for a walk after their meals. So as much as we do want to certainly use supplements, if you are struggling with your gut health, don't forget uh, some of the basics, right? Like chewing your food, attentive eating, not power shoveling your meal, getting into a decent sort of parasympathetic state, both post-training or like, you know, if you had a super stressful work event happen uh, or you just got a massive argument, probably not like your best time to just like go scarf down some food, right? We want to maybe take a minute, breathe for a little bit and, uh, you know, make sure that we're, we're in the best state possible for actually absorbing those nutrients. So it can certainly vary there. I would say less low hanging fruit, but still valid solutions and considerations would be getting some serum lab testing done. So, um, things like knowing your CRP levels, homocysteine, looking at your blood sugar management through a fasting insulin, glucose, A1C, and, uh, also looking at something like your vitamin D status, just to make sure because if you are struggling with mood, it could it could just be seasonal affective disorder and low vitamin D levels as well. So don't overlook that. I still think if it's something that's ongoing for you, certainly seek out advice from the appropriate health professional or um, talk about you know potentially going to counseling or therapy. But a lot of folks actually, especially in northern states or if you're further away from the equator, it's it's actually an issue of seasonal affective disorder, inadequate vitamin D status, and that really impacts someone's mood. And if they notice it's very cyclical, like it happens from like November, December through February, then it's probably a good indication that it could be more seasonal for you and is related to uh, that vitamin D level. Being in Ohio, I know that for sure. I, it is a, a time for me that I have to uh, double up on my my vitamin D supplementation because I can get outside, but I don't know if we've seen the sun in at least three or four days. Like it has been very gloomy and dark here all day. So I know that for myself, the having the vitamin D supplementation is very very important. And before we get into to each of these and kind of. Um, maybe get a little bit deeper with them. Is there a, a time frame that you would suggest implementing some of these changes that you would want to reevaluate and say, okay, is this actually helping me? Am I noticing any difference? Is there a timetable for that? So supplementation, I usually feel like you have to give it a couple months. 
Um, if you're making changes based on your food log, let's say you start with a coach and you start making some modifications, you know, that can take a few weeks as well. Um, the only things I think we can tell more immediate differences is like, let's say you start improving your sleep quality and sleep quantity. You know, we can feel well rested the next day. That's a little bit more realistic. Um, if you were to reduce your training volume and deload, you'd probably feel a difference within a week or two, uh, and then potentially see performance improvements. As far as serum lab testing goes, I, I think probably wait three to six months, uh, depending on the case, right? If you haven't had labs done in a long time, you might actually just want to get a baseline to see where you're at and have an idea of your your markers and parameters. Uh, but that's probably more three three to six month window. And then some of these are just going to be more of your uh, life staples. So if you know that you're more prone to vitamin D deficiency, and that can be based on geographic location, ethnicity, uh, you know, kind of personal dietary preferences and what you're consuming, you, you may just need to leave like a D3, K2 supplement in your arsenal all the time. And that that's, that's okay. Some supplements are, are needed uh, to that extent for the micronutrient support. So I'd say the actual time frame may vary depending on the particular intervention, but things like our supplements, usually we need a little bit of time to let those work. Whereas uh, pretend, potentially something like a deload or, you know, sleep or even seeking counseling, connection, community, those things can have more immediate impact, right? You could leave, uh, some type of uh, session where, where you were seeking counseling or therapy and feel significantly better. You could go for a nature walk and be relaxed and in a parasympathetic state at that time. You could listen to music or you know, do something else like breath work and feel a more immediate physio like both physical and physiological difference where some of these other things are, are like long-term players. We're just planting the seeds to improve our health over time. If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. And with the lifestyle factors of, of improving environment and, the, and those things, I find that individuals have often normalize the environment that they're in that has been much more stressful. And so I think that another thing to add there is to ensure that you are really evaluating how you feel after the fact. Do you have any anxiousness going to be around your family or, or be around uh, coworkers or what have you to really analyze how this is impacting your, your mental health and uh, those different factors? I find that to be a, a big help for sure. Yeah. A lot of clients are so used to running around with like their hair on fire. Um, you know, you can, sort of tell by sometimes like how people answer messages or emails, or if you were to hop on a phone call, like what's going on in the process. Uh, that's why I think, you know, when, and this kind of brings us to a broader conversation of a health journey and, and also coaching. So this is why it's really important to have thorough intake forms and intake and onboarding process, because like you can identify things in the lifestyle. Someone might turn in their, their food log and their training, and it might theoretically look great on paper. But if the lifestyle is off and there's things that are contributing to very high stress or um, we're burning the candle at both ends, low sleep, or we've gotten used to essentially this very high stress environment, I'm all for resiliency. Like I think just as humans, like it's great to cultivate some grit and resiliency. It doesn't mean you can't work hard. That's not what Alex and I are saying. It's just important to balance that hard work and sort of deliberate intentional effort with some very deliberate intentional recovery time too. So it's like work hard, but also like, place significant emphasis on your recovery also. I will say that the the notion of working hard but also recovering harder is something where that's coming from experience. Like we have pushed well beyond the boundary a number of times to realize like this is actually a better avenue for us to take to actually have this recovery period and seeing the results that we want. Because I know that for myself, I found myself many a times just continuing to push, 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 pedal to the metal. And that's when I probably am, am doing the worst in terms of the progress that I'm wanting to make, with whatever the situation is, you kind of get to the other side and, and actually give yourself the time to rest and relax and recover and realize that that was exactly what you probably needed anyway to make the progress that you were just constantly fighting for as a whole. Yeah. And I think that's certainly true for training and it's, it's okay to have periods where we do push um, or seasons of that, but it just has to be balanced with, I think, other stimulus, right? And then for for some folks, there's a difference too between you know being a hard worker and and working intelligently versus just getting to this place where um, we're so reactive. You know, we're we're just so reactive all the time, both in our schedule and in our interactions with other people, 
that it's just uh, completely overriding like everything else that's going on. So you do have to really audit that from you know an individual perspective and see what's going on because if you you can you can work on the nutrition, you can work on the training, but if sleep's off, stress is off, lifestyle's off, it does make it harder. It's not that you can't still make some progress. It's just like kind of swimming upstream versus getting everything working together and having this nice nice symphony. Uh, which I think is super, super important. So, you know, really don't neglect that. That's where when we see complex cases, whether it's hormonal dysfunction, autoimmunity, gut health issues, we have to look at it as like a 360 approach. It can't just solely be, um, you know, your, your nutrition modifications will help. Training modifications will help. But I really think a lot of people just kind of like treat it as if they live two different lives. It's like, this is who I am in the gym and in the kitchen. And then when I'm outside of that, like my health practices kind of go out the window. Right. Uh, and I think it's important to kind of keep them as part of one conversation and then use different strategies that work for you to improve your overall health. Right. I think that it is a, a viewpoint that is seeing the training and nutrition as these massive rocks and then sleep and, and lifestyle factors as these little pebbles that are contributing to their uh, results. Whereas they're really all a similar size rock, some maybe being larger than others, but the reality is, is being able to have the focus on all of them and prioritizing all of them is where they're going to see the the greatest health strides and, and those different factors. Yeah. And that's where periodization and planning comes in and having a great coach, because let's say you have, we are actually talking about some friends who have kids as, as we got on the podcast prior to recording. If I know that a client's in a phase of life where you know, they just had a newborn and they're going to be lacking sleep for a while. Well, we need to look at stimulus and stress from other areas because sleep isn't going to be as optimal as it would be or, or as it was just months prior. So it's okay to move to maybe instead of five training days, we're doing four training days. That's okay for that client within the context of what they're experiencing in their life. If they're trying to be present for other things, we can still preserve muscle tissue, can do a lot in terms of like maintenance volume and everything. And we can still continue to, uh, you know, optimize our nutrition, do what we need to do. We just need to be understanding of the real life circumstances that that human is dealing with at the given time. And that's where sometimes it's a conversation of like people over protocols, right? Is like, I have to be able to look at this person, what they're experiencing and make the adjustment accordingly, uh, versus saying, okay, yeah, this is a great time to push like high frequency or high volume for the guy that like has a newborn at home and is still trying to work a full-time job and has all these other things going on, going on, um, or maybe someone who's experiencing a significant life change, that's when it's probably okay to call an audible, right? So it's like, we just need to be able to have those honest conversations. And I totally agree that, you know, some people look at like, well, training and nutrition are my big rocks. When in reality, um, there are a lot of different sort of cornerstones to this transformation process, and they are all worthy of conversation. It's just going to be, your, you're going to have different points in your life where certain things are either more important than others, or you need to really focus on one, um, even more than before, right? Maybe you, you didn't need, as a young adult, maybe you didn't need great stress, stress management practices. But I know Alex and I can attest to, like, as you grow as a coach or a business owner and have other responsibilities on your plate, you do need to devote more time and energy uh, to making sure that those, those practices exist in your life. I will say that in the time of, of higher stress or, or poor sleep, that it is okay to shift your focus to other modes of fitness as well. It doesn't have to always be just resistance training because that's what you've always done. Like it is okay to navigate into using yoga or hiking as a, a mode that is going to be great from a, a fitness standpoint, but is also probably going to be a little bit more gentle on you from a, a, a inflammatory response perspective and, and fatigue that you may be experiencing or the fatigue that's already kind of at a higher baseline because of the poor sleep or higher stress that you're experiencing. So um, that is a, a useful thing that it doesn't have to just be resistance training. And I will speak for myself that one of my stress relieving practices as of late has actually been yoga. And I am getting my ass kicked in that on a <laughs> twice a week basis. It has uh, been a learning experience for sure. Yeah. I was about to say it's Yogi AB on the mic. <laughs> yeah. uh, I've been catching that a little bit in your stories, but I, I've actually been doing like an express like a shorter class, like I'm, I'm not quite ready for like the 90 minute situation. So like a 45 to 60 minute hot yoga class can be good. Also for those of us who need to work on our mobility that sit a lot, uh, can be very good. And also just kind of forcing you to be away from your electronics for a little bit because they overheat in the hot room. <laughs> so there's a lot of benefits that can come with it. You and I are on a similar journey there. Uh, incorporating that, uh, I think is super helpful, but you got to find the flavor that works for you. So for some people, maybe that's yoga for other people it could be outdoor walk. Um, 
You know, I know Alex and I are both big on pets. There's a lot of other things we can do that are maybe unconventional in the sense of they're not always falling into the health and fitness conversation, but they do play a really important role overall um, in conversations like what we're having today in terms of gut health, mental health, and overall, you know, transformation journey. Well, that was super helpful, Sam. I appreciate you abundantly coming on and being my first ever interview on the podcast. I know we're 100 plus episodes in, but this has been a fantastic intro to having guests on the on the podcast. I appreciate you having me, man. It was great to be here and uh, I'm wishing you luck on your next few that you have coming up. I appreciate that. Will you let the people know where they can find you? Sure. So I'm Sam Miller Science on all major platforms. So it's Instagram. I also hang out on my pod- podcast, which is Sam Miller Science, mostly shorter solo episodes on topics uh, that I kind of break down similar to what we talked about today. And that's just to make it more digestible uh, so that you can apply it you know, in your life. Uh, I also have a book, Metabolism Made Simple. You can find that at metabolismmadesimple.com. Um, everything else is just kind of similar science. So similar science.com, uh, similar science on Instagram and the podcast. You can learn, um, through my social content that I have, that's kind of your social, your, your shorter digestible nuggets are going to be on Instagram. And, uh, then, you know, if you're looking for something to kind of learn how I think about things in terms of nutrition, uh, the book is a great starting point for that. And I also have some other free resources, different checklists and workshops, things like that for, uh, any coaches who are listening to the show as well. Thank you so much. And, uh, see you guys in the next episode.